Something very funny that happened in the time of Imam Al Ghazali, Rahimullah Ta'ala. Imam Al Ghazali, Rahimullah Ta'ala, one time he was robbed by bandits, and Imam Al Ghazali, Rahimullah Ta'ala, is running behind them. He's saying to them, All that which is inside these boxes that you've nicked is my books that I traveled for, and that which I have documented, please give it back. So the thief is running away and he's hearing. Muhammad al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala saying this and he stops so there was a bunch of thieves the biggest of them started laughing at him he said to him how is it that you can claim that you have knowledge but when we in fact took these boxes of yours all of a sudden you became somebody who did not know anything the thief is laughing at him and then he felt sorry for him and he gave him the boxes he goes go take it Al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, this is a man who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him speak to give me guidance in my affair. So he said he went back and for a whole three years he started memorizing everything that he documented. So if in the future highway bandits end up robbing his stuff again, he wouldn't necessarily mind, take it, my ilm is with me in my chest. He was guided because of a thief. One man came along and he did something that popularized the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like a focus on the path, not just nominal worship. So one man came along, 450 Hijri, and he had some personal experiences. He died in 505 at the age of 55 only. He is considered to be the man that popularized Sufism among the masses, made it acceptable for them. Because the way he explained these things, you have to remember, they spoke in allusions in very high kind of language. So for the common folk, it was very difficult for them to understand that. And until now, there was no formal Sheikh murid relationship. Fifth century, until Imam Ghazali died, there were hardly any formal tariqs. Imam Ghazali, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, Hujjatul Islam, he is the one who is considered responsible for turning people's attention to the yearning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the way he described through his magnum opus, which is the Ihya Ulum al-Din in numerous volumes, the way he explained this, which is called the revival of the religious sciences. He was obviously not one who was born into Sufism. His father died at a young age and he was looked after by somebody else and his mother. And he and his brother, his brother was a very famous Sufi, Ahmed al-Ghazali, right? But Sheikh Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, he was into the sciences first. He became such a great scholar because he was ingenuous. He was uh, uh, remarkable in his understanding and in his memory and in everything. That he was put into the highest place that any scholar could be put. And they had one vizier whose name was Nidham, he was known as Nidham al-Mulk. He was Shafi'i, and he established a series of colleges, universities. One in uh, Naysabur, uh, another one in Baghdad, uh, and Shiraz and other areas. The Baghdad one, you know, like we have Harvard today, Yale, we have Oxford, Cambridge. The Baghdad one was the center of learning. Baghdad was the center of the caliphate. This is where many of the scholars flocked. You had some good scholars there. <coughs> Imam Ghazali was originally from Persia, he was from Tus, which is in Iran today. But he went to Baghdad as well. And people recognized him. Remember, he's very young. So this was probably when he was 30-something. He became the top scholar of the country, of the Islamic lands. Coveted position. Everybody wanted that position. He got it. And his crisis was different because the, the thing about Imam Ghazali was many people, if we study something, we will study it with a bias. And I'm not trying to do that here. I'm trying my best, right? But it's very difficult for people to completely shed everything that you know about something and to study it. Most people can't do it. What he did was, he said, I came to a crisis in my faith. I didn't know what to believe. He says there were three main groups that were prominent in my time. The Sufis, the Batinites, 
Muslim philosophers that taken from the Greek philosophy, the Neo Neoplatonists. He said, I studied each one of these groups. The Baltinites, they talked about some inner reading, hidden reading of the Quran. So they wouldn't take it, it says, Aqimu salah, establish the prayer, they wouldn't take that. They would say, oh, it means something else in between. So they could write, and it was a highly secretive, kind of arcane cult. These were the Baltinites. Right? Alhamdulillah, we, don't, we no longer have a formal group called the Balti Knights, but that was their function. So, I mean, it's only their Imam who knows the true understanding and you have to be, in, uh, you have to be uh, entered into, the, into this group to be able to learn that. He says, that can't be the right way. But he, he said, I stripped my mind of all beliefs. I was in a crisis and I went and studied this. I found that this couldn't be it. Then I studied the Sufis. And I studied the philosophy. It says, in two years, despite my busy schedule, in, the, in my free time, I studied all of the books of the philosophers. And then he wrote a book called uh, the, the Maqasidul Falasifa, the main objectives of the philosophers. It was such a great book that was written in such a neutral way that the later, even Christian philosophers, consider him to be among the Muslim philosophers because they think his, his contribution is great. Then after that, when he found out that it's a lot of incoherence in there, they say one thing, but they can't, they, it can't be really true because there's somebody else that contradicts it. There's no absolute truth in there. Then he wrote the Tahafatul Falasifa, the incoherence of the philosophers. And in there, he did what no other scholar until now had done because the philosophy was coming into the Muslim circles and there were people who had taken it on like Ibn Sina, Al-Farabi, and none of the Muslim scholars were able to, uh, to oppose it properly. Because they hadn't studied it. He studied it, and then the way he wrote about it. He says, I can't understand. Look at, look at the demeaning way he writes about it. He says, I can't understand how these people even can come to this conclusion. Even a young child would not come to this conclusion. He ridiculed them. He says in Baghdad, he says, I, spent three, I spent two years studying philosophy. Two years. And then one year reflecting on it. One year critically appraising philosophy. And you'll see in the Munqid, he says, he's not like he just studied Ibn Sina or the Muslim, the Arab, you know, transmitters of Greek philosophy. No, 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 no. He studied actual Greek philosophy. He says there were all, there were all these guys, you know, you know, Dionysus and or Diogenes and, you know, who and what and Plotinus. He said they're all just, they're nonsense. They're just, they're just, just nonsense. And actually, Aristotle refuted all of them. So I don't need to. He said Aristotle was right about them. He said there are three great Greek philosophers. There is Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. All three of these guys were basically muwahideen. They were basically monotheists. But there was kufr in their work. There's kufr in what they said. Aristotle refuted Socrates and Plato, so I don't have to. So I'm just going to focus on Aristotle. Aristotle's, Aristotle's the closest. He's the closest to proper belief. But there's still kufr in what he says. Then he said, and there's, then there's a whole lot of Muslim guys. And all of them are nonsense. They, none of them understand Greek philosophy. Except for two. Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina. These guys are the end boss, end level bosses of philosophy. They really know what they're talking about. They have faithfully transmitted Aristotelian doctrine. And in some cases, improved on it. So what does he do? He writes three works. Work number one <coughs> is the Mi'yarul Ilm. He says this is to teach you logic. Because if you don't know logic, you can never understand philosophy. So here is the explanation of the terms they use, what those terms mean, how we use those terms. Then he wrote a word called Maqasid al-Falasifa. Maqasid al-Falasifa, he says, I'm just going to lay out here what philosophers believe. That's all. Nothing else. The third work, at tahafut al falasifa the incoherence, the logical inconsistencies of the philosophers. And that work, I'm going to critique philosophy. That Ghazali first mastered philosophy. Then he was in a position to properly critique it. Now how was he able to do all of this? How come he did not drown in the same seas that Ibn Sina drowned in? The same seas that Farabi drowned in? The same seas that the, the, the Ismailis drowned in? Or that the Mu'tazilis drowned in? Do you know why? Because he was already 
absolutely solidly grounded in theology and in fiqh. He was already a mujaddid, already a mujtahid in Shafi'i fiqh. Already the greatest usuli that had ever lived. But he studied with the greatest proponent of you know, intellectual theology, probably that had ever lived, who was Joini. He was, because he was so solidly grounded, because his ship was, was so, you know, waterproof, effectively, he could sail on those seas and not sink. So he writes the Maqasid. The Maqasid, he's criticized. What? What is this? You've laid out the doctrine of the philosophers better than Ibn Sina laid it out. And Ibn Sina was the great sheikh of, of Muslim philosophy. He was on who Islamicized philosophy. And what Ghazali did, and this was his greatness, in the whole of philosophy, did he refute philosophy? No, he refuted 20 points. He took 20 premises of philosophers. And that's what he refuted. He said, this is what's rubbish about philosophy. This is what they've got wrong. And I'm going to prove that it's wrong. It's not from Quran and Sunnah. I'm going to prove it's wrong with philosophy. And that's why the work is called the tahafut, the incoherence of the philosophers. Because actually what he is saying is, you're saying that the world has always existed, that the, 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 the universe has always existed. But actually, if you follow your premises round, that you your, follow the trail of breadcrumbs, you actually find that by showing that the world has always existed, you are proving that the world has not always existed. So actually, your argument in and of itself makes no sense. It is intern, not externally wrong. It is internally wrong. You guys have misunderstood philosophy, and that's amazing. It was an amazing work. But the maqasid, the work here, the work here is, I'm not going to any judgment call, this is just what philosophers believe. That work was translated, it went throughout the Muslim world, and it was translated eventually into Latin. The, the prologue got left somewhere. And so it was just a work about, this is the philosophy of Aristotle. It was translated and it came eventually to the Christian world, and it was, and it was taken up by... Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas. And St. Thomas Aquinas used large parts of the Maqasid al falasafa and also Ibn Rushd's refutation of the Tahafut, on which to base his own synthesis of Christian belief and Greek philosophy. And that work is pretty much the single most important work in the development of all Western thought, the Summa Theologica, and the Summa Contra uh, Gentilis. These are the most important works in the whole of Western thought, and they were very influenced by what Ghazali had written in the Maqasid. Because people didn't believe that an Arab scholar had written this work. People believed for hundreds of years that the Maqasid was actually written by Aristotle and simply translated into Arabic and then translated into Latin. They took that and they mistook it completely for Aristotle's actual... That's how brilliant an exposition of philosophy it was. And Ghazali spent, according to his own, uh, his own admission, two years studying philosophy and one year reflecting on it. So Ghazali was in a situation where there was a huge influence. The Shia, the Mu'tazila, the Muslim philosophers, all influenced by Greek philosophy, and all of them, the, the religion was going this way and that way. And what he did, he went to the root. The root's philosophy, that sort philosophy out, sorted. But what he did was incorporated a lot of what was right about philosophy into religion. And this is this very important point the Prophet ﷺ said, that al-hikmatu, wisdom, is the lost property of the believer. Wherever he finds it, he has the more right to it, or he takes it. And what Ghazali did beautifully was synthesize. This is his great achievement. He could take things in, and he could filter. This is useful, this is not. And he said most of what's true in philosophy is what the philosophers themselves have taken from their Sufis, 
from whatever ancient prophets came to them and whatever their spirit that those people of spirituality and saints those words that have come like about morals and stuff have, that have come forward are actually from they are actually a form of divine dispensation and so he took it and that was his great achievement but this was what was going on in the Muslim world at the time it would not have been fun to live in the 5th century there were so many political currents pulling in different directions so many intellectual currents, currents pulling in different directions so then he discovered that that's not the way he said if there is any way it's the way of the Sufis because then I started recognizing that I'm doing all of this for show I'm in the highest position I'm the most celebrated scholar he started saying that uh, this was all for vain glory and uh, uh, arrogance and uh, self-conceit and th there's no ikhlas and he said I had this internal dilemma now I had my faith I knew what I was longing for but I had to get out of this position but I couldn't he says Allah made it easy for me he inflicted me with a calamity that I was unable to speak if you are one to give durus if you're one to teach to all of the great scholars of the time and you can't speak anymore that's a calamity for you but he said that that helped me finally make up my mind because I used to make up my mind but then I used to break it finally this time when this happened I realized that I had to leave this he left it people were like why are you leaving this people couldn't understand what I was doing it was crazy for anybody to do because it was it was considered the highest position he went he left he stayed for about 10 to 11 years nobody knows exactly what he did during those times we know he went to Jerusalem stayed there for a long time he went to the Haramain he stayed there for a while and a lot of the time he spent in Damascus in the Jamia al-Umawi in, in a room there he says this is where Allah opened up many things to me this is when I got my realization when I got my enlightenment that's when he wrote the Ihya Ulum al -Din, the revival of the religious sciences he comes back finally and he doesn't want to take that position that he's being forced take this position. finally he agreed to do some teaching close to his hometown and took on some students and then he wrote a number of other books the beginning of guidance he wrote the Mishkatul Anwar he wrote but his book the revival of the religion sciences Ihya Ulum al -Din, is the one that popularized the soul the way he explains he's, he's a Persian highly articulate uh, his literature, literature is studied in the history of Arabic literature and you should read it he's a psychologist the way he speaks the way he explains things absolutely fantastic yes there are criticisms on him Ibn Taymiyyah Ibn al a number of these scholars have criticized aspects of his work basically their criticism is that he's mentioning things in there which are difficult for other people to understand he's mentions a lot of weak hadith no doubt he does Right? Some fabricated narrations in, in the book as well. No doubt that, that those are there. He wasn't a hadith scholar. He actually studying hadith afterwards on his way back. He died with a copy of Sahih al-Bukhari or something on his chest. Basically what scholars say is that he guaranteed Sufism an official place in Orthodox Islam alongside law and theology. Just like Aqidah was a subject and Fiqh became a subject, Hadith studies was another science, Tasawwuf became a subject.